Hi, my name is Catherine Thayer, and this presentation will be about the molecular biologist Salvador E. Luria. Salvador E. Luria was born in Turin, Italy on August 13, 1912. His parents originally named him Salvatore with no middle initial, but he changed the T to a D and added the E once he arrived in New York City in 1940. How, when, and why did he go there? Luria grew up Jewish during the rise of fascism in Italy. Mussolini declared himself Il Duce in 1925, after having become Prime Minister in 1922, when Luria was in his early teens. Luria finished up his studies in radiology at the University of Rome just as anti-Semitic laws were being passed in Italy. He was barred from academic research, so Luria went to Paris to study radiation and its effects on bacteriophage, viruses that infect bacteria, with biophysicist Fernand Holweck. But France was soon invaded by Germany. Luria fled Europe at that time. Once in New York, he continued his work on radiation and bacteriophage. In the process of doing so, he took some of the first electron microscope images of bacteriophage with the physicist Thomas Anderson. He was also finally able to meet Max Delbruck. Luria had learned about Delbruck's theories on the gene as a molecule while studying with Holbeck in Paris and had been pretty inspired, as had a number of other prominent figures, including Erwin Schrodinger. Once Luria and Delbruck met, they quickly started working together on bacteriophage. Along with several other young scientists, including Alfred Hershey, with whom they shared the 1969 Nobel Peace Prize in Medicine, they formed the Phage Group and started doing research together at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in Long Island, New York. It wasn't until 1943, however, that Lurie and Delbruck had the biggest breakthrough of either of their careers. They published a groundbreaking work in the journal Genetics with a paper entitled Mutations of Bacteria from Virus Sensitivity to Virus Resistance. What question did Lurie and Delbruck answer? Specifically, whether or not virus-resistant bacterial strains achieved resistance before or after exposure to the virus. More broadly, they were trying to answer if natural selection, in this case for virus resistance, aligned with neo-Darwinian or Lamarckian theories. The neo-Darwinian theory holds that mutations are the source of phenotypic variation, and mutations are random to environmental conditions. Lamarckian theory states that phenotypic variation depends on acquired characteristics induced by the environment itself. Which one is correct, and how were Luria and Dilbrook able to prove it? Well, Dilbrook did the stats, the math, and Luria did the science. He grew cultures of Escherichia coli B from several small, non-resistant inoculation populations. After multiplying, these culture populations were plated in several series, in which they were simultaneously exposed to the bacteriophage virus alpha. Virus alpha acts on bacteria by lysing it or killing it, stopping it from multiplying. Lysis is readily observable in a population of bacteria. It causes the rate of growth of the population to slow. However, Luria and Dilbrook observed that non-lysogenic populations of E. coli continue to grow in the plates. Luria, with the help of Dilbrook's math expertise, proposed two hypotheses. If the Lamarckian hypothesis were correct, then the viral resistance would have been induced by the presence of the virus, and the variance in number of E. coli bacteria between similar platings would be about equal to the average number. If the Neo-Darwinian hypothesis were correct, then the viral resistance would have arisen from a random mutation, and the variance would be larger than the average. The number of resistant bacteria would depend on how many generations go before being exposed to the virus the mutation arose. They found that indeed, the variance was greater than the mean. But what if bacterial resistance actually came about after a couple of generations of the mutation being present? A sort of hybrid theory. Lurie and Delbrook state that if this were the case, the cultures with just one resistant bacteria would be rare. Needing multiple generations for a mutation to confer resistance means that many generations of offspring with the mutation would need to be produced before any could be observed. The offspring of the last non-resistant but mutated generation would show up as resistant all at once. They saw that this did not happen. There were high proportions of cultures with only one or two resistant bacteria. From this, they concluded that bacterial resistance must be expressed if the mutation is present, that there is no delay, and that the change from sensitive to resistant is independent of the environmental conditions, that bacterial resistance is heritable, that viral resistance may be traceable to a specific mutation in the genome, and ultimately that the random mutation hypothesis, or the neo darwinian theory of natural selection, proved explanatory. With this study, Luria and Delbrook clarified the nature of bacterial inheritance and variation. They also illuminated the fact that disease exposure only selects for the continued survival of resistance-granting mutations. It does not cause such mutations. This has implications for our current understanding of disease resistance. Finally, their methodological success illustrated the power of statistics in proving otherwise unobservable phenomena. Of course, Lurie wasn't just a geneticist. He also had a family. Here he is with his wife, Zella, a psychologist whom he married in 1945, and he held strong anti-war and anti-nuclear power views and was outspoken about the role of science in solving social problems. Finally, he was also mortal. On February 6, 
1991, Salvador Eluria had a heart attack in Lexington, Massachusetts. He died. And that's all. Thank you for watching.